the first time someone told me that I can sit down with God and just have a conversation. Just never knew that was available. And I remember after that conversation, they left to go to bed and I took a pillow and a blanket and I just laid it on the floor and I said, here I am, you know. And it was just like the first time that I felt the presence of the Lord kind of come down and hug me and embrace me. And um, that was something I never experienced in anything. Peace, love, blessings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome back to another episode of Life, Love, and Live in Water. Yeah. Today, we got a special guest on the show. This is Joseph Madigan. Yo. A.K.A. Madigan Music. Don't get me Madigan. Oh, don't get him Madigan, man. <laughs> uh, this is a good brother of mine. We have crossed paths a few times uh, physically, but more than that, spiritually. Uh, we mm. met about a year ago at an event, and uh, from that moment on, man, um, We've kept in contact with each other. Mm -hmm. Joseph is a husband. He's a father. He makes music, fire music, by the way. Might throw in a little track or something. But uh, anything, you. anything you want to say about yourself, man? I mean, you you covered it pretty well. Husband, father, in that order. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like those are the definitely the the two things I aspire to be the most out of anything. So, amen. Um, and that's one thing I can say, man, is that whenever we do talk, you are very centered around the importance of your marriage. Yeah. And uh, it inspires me, man. I don't have a lot of iron that I can brush up against. Yeah. That can sharpen me in that way. So I appreciate Super that. Important. Yeah. Joseph drove three and a half hours this morning, him, his wife, and his beautiful baby. Five months. Yeah, five month old, brand new. She slept the whole time. Though. That was that was actually nice. <laughs> Hopefully she'll sleep on the way back. Yes. Oh, please, Lord. Let it be so. We've had a pretty full day. We've shot some content, shot some videos. We mm. did a photo shoot with the with the family. We did a lot, man. I, I had a, a, a step into your life today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like my wife, she's a homebody, so like I feel like the closer I've gotten to her, mm. the more I've learned to see home as a safe place. And I actually enjoy spending time at home when home was never that for me. Mm. So I'm gonna move this just, oh, you good. just inside. Yeah. Wonderful. Get it right. <laughs> so uh yeah, we got the wifeys here with us today. Amen. God yeah. bless them. Oh I'm man. Thankful for that. My beautiful wife is sitting over yeah. here staring at me and Joseph is in the back room with the Take little care one. Of the baby. Yeah. So we got five questions prepared for each other, man, that we yep. were seeking the Lord on and we just trust that the Lord is gonna have his way in this moment and I'm looking forward to it, man. So you wanna go first? You want me to go first? Well, you know, do you do the honors? I got you, man. Got you. This is your fresh yeah, off the your press. Pod. <laughs> so, man, uh, just to get it rolling. How has knowing Jesus paid off in your life? Oh wow, <sighs> it's a podcast, so we have time to talk. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I I've probably been abused and locked in a room most of my childhood. So wasn't very, like, a, was very self-conscious, social anxiety. Um, I was always grounded, and I was deemed a liar, labeled a liar. Mm. So it didn't matter past that label what I said mm. after a while. It just was like, you did it <laughs> and I would just get grounded for months at a time like it started with like physical abuse um some very graphic physical abuse like one of my stepfathers would make us kneel on rice in a corner and we would look at the wall for an hour and if we like turned around he would slap us or uh, one time he put my hand over the stove and it was like, don't play with the stove. Like, it's hot, you see, it burned my hand. Um, different physical abuse that I went through like that. Just my mom was a hardworking woman. And so, but she would date these men and they would kind of be our caretakers. And as you know, it's like 
you're never gonna love like there's some people that i feel i can get there and praise god for great stepfathers that like almost and essentially become a father to children but um there's a lot of people that don't take that role seriously and end up damaging the kids when mom isn't around because they don't have that you know and so I spent a lot of time in my room, started smoking weed when I was 11 years old, started getting into drugs and just going and taking stuff and stealing stuff. And I was very bound by anxiety. Um, just even going outside and talking to people was a very hard for me to, thing for me to do. And I wanted acceptance so bad in life like I yearned for acceptance that I would do things that was knowingly like you're trying to fit in or you're trying to please or over please people for this acceptance and it's almost off-putting it's like yeah you're weird why are you doing that like that was a lot of the response I got which made me even more insecure about like being social so ended up being homeless at 16 years old and basically walked away from a ground I was grounded to the basement at the time for three months and all I could do was like wash clothes and they would tell me to come up and eat after they ate dinner and mm. it was just it was very unhealthy and more than anything I knew even being homeless I had more freedom than being in in that house and so um it basically was a day where my mom, um, and I'm getting to the part, I'm, I'm not trying to give you like a super long answer, but I want to give you context to what Jesus did. Yeah, yeah. And um, one day, my mom, basically, one of my stepdads had put his hands on my mom, and I heard her crying through the door. I come through, I heard her on the phone talking about it. I said, what happened? She kind of lied at first. It was like nothing. I was like, I heard what happened. She was like, we're done, we're leaving. So I got kind of excited, even though that was a little selfish. I usually got off ground whenever she left the man. So I was like downstairs packing my bag. Like I'm, I'm doing, like I'm kind of excited about it. And he comes in, they start having a conversation. When I walk upstairs, my mom had walked in her room and then he was like right in front of me. He saw me with my bag and he goes, go downstairs and I said no I lost all respect for you when you touch my mom now I'm like 16 years old I'm probably like 120 pounds sucking wet mm. I'm at the top of these stairs he goes go downstairs and I said no he pushed me down the stairs so I had this moment where been so pushed away by my family by everyone told that I was nothing I'm at the bottom of these stairs and I'm like if my mom doesn't come and check on me, she doesn't love me. And that was the thought that I had. So I waited at the bottom of the stairs and I just waited and she never came. So instantly I was filled with revenge. Like I wanted revenge. I wanted him to pay for pushing me down the stairs. And I'm like, I got him now because he, he did something to me physically now. Right he's very mentally abusive never put his hands on us this one and so i left and called the cops the cops come and my mom didn't believe me because of my lying labels and so she kind of stood up for him in this situation and they told me you're 16 years old you don't need to be emancipated if you don't feel safe you can leave so I got one bag of clothes, I left, and it was probably one of the happiest moments, walking away, thinking I get to find out who I am now, instead of listening to what everybody thought about me. And um, I went house to house for a while, Finished my fifth year of high school, going house to house, and a lot of people helping me. Shout out Eric Riley, a couple people that let me stay in their house. And I was still in drugs and drinking. And then um, 
then it just a year after after graduating i was in this place where i was like i'm just i'm just falling into dumb stuff like i'm just continuing to go down a path of just drugs and just dumb stuff and i was like man i really want to change so i had an opportunity and i ended up going to my dad's to florida he had talked to a pastor in marion indiana and this pastor was like a brother to him and they had a program through a church called worship uh, bethel worship center and they were taking in like 16 to 18 year olds to get them on their feet and is that like the bethel music mm, no not the same thing oh, okay, okay. no no no. that's in redding california but this is marion indiana okay so um i go there like as a last ditch effort like i had no money i had nowhere to go my mom pays for my ticket for me to take a bus to Indiana to try to start my life. And it was a faith-based program and I encounter God and that changed everything. I remember the first time someone told me that I can sit down with God and just have a conversation just never knew that was available and I remember after that conversation they left to go to bed and I took a pillow and a blanket and I just laid it on the floor and I said here I am you know and it was just like the first time that I felt the presence of the Lord kind of come down and hug me and embrace me and um, that was something I never experienced in anything so it was the first time that I felt accepted. I felt fullness of love and his embrace. And it changed everything for me. From then on, I never turned back. I never turned back. To, and anything that I could do to get closer to God and and discover him. And and then there was just multiple things. I, I mean, I... I <laughs> When you ask me that question, how has Jesus changed me? He changed everything. Like, I'm probably, if, if you heard me talk, if you see me be around people, you wouldn't think that I had social anxiety. That what I was afraid to be myself. But God taught me to love myself. That was a hard thing. But I remember there was a switch where, like, I, I wanted approval so much from people around. And then finally, I was like, I love Joseph. I love who God made me to be. And I understood that I was not like other people. Like I'm silly. I like to, I like to laugh. I like to have fun. I think we all do, man. Yeah. And but but I would do it outside of the context that people <laughs> probably thought I should. But I'm like, this is authentically me. Yeah. So like I'm not gonna let, you know. At the same time, there's lines there, right? There's a time and place for everything. I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> go to a place where I shouldn't be, like, laughing and joyful and actually, like, mournful and respectful. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, in that situation. But it changed everything for me, bro. I went to through that program, ended up going to college, getting my bachelor's degree. How old was you when you went through the program? Uh, I was about 19 at that time. Mm. So... It was about three, three and a half years that I was kind of house to house since that time I left my home. I went through my first, kind of the only faith-based thing I ever went through, um, the refuge. Mm -hmm. I was 20. I was only there for 46 days. Mm -hmm. But I encountered the Lord. <clears throat> and it was like the upbringing that I was raised in it like painted the picture inside of me that like whenever you encounter the Lord, and based off of how I saw it working my parents, you know, they never really backslid. It's like whenever you get salvation, you're mm -hmm. changed and there is no more going back. And if you do go back, you probably never had salvation to begin with. Mm -hmm. That was like the Baptist way I saw. Yeah. So whenever I had this encounter with the Lord, bro, I was like, no doubt. I've had an encounter with God. Yeah. And my soul is saved. I'm out of here. Dude, looking back, it was like God had me in an environment that was, you know, spiritually rich in a place where he could 
develop my mind yeah and root me in his presence mm. and i ran back to the world yeah and found myself outside of his presence really quickly bro um i mean but also too i feel like even in places that are meant to prepare you for that very rare like i've been walking with christ for 10 years and i've been places i just had someone teach me how to read the bible that was the first time how to study it yeah someone someone sat down and said look at this is how you underline and circle the main points and then this is how you build the outline in your journal like i've never seen somebody do that me neither (laughs) it's a 101 like bro if we're gonna teach people how to and and it's kind of this thing that john piper has talked about if you let yourself be the authority and you don't show how you got your truth from the scripture then the authority is not put back into the bible into the text you leave the authority in your hands and then what happens is people start to trust people based on honor and relationship instead of actually realizing that no this truth came from here in the word and and look at how it breathes this reality Mm. into existence and this is what's available if you would get into this yeah and i think that's something that um is necessary for growth you know for sure man well i know in my reading experience man um i know for sure the lord wanted me to read it front to back Mm. you know i've been exposed to so much preaching Mm. from like the old testament and all this stuff and i've heard the stories but for me to read it myself and see like this isn't chronological chronological order Mm. it's helping me make so much sense of things that i've heard and gain of understanding of like what god's relationship with man was looking like how we got to where we're at right now yeah why jesus came um so i'm thankful for that but i'm also i see the fruit of people who study the word man yeah and what that does for their life and it's like i want that oh yeah i want that and i'm quick to like want to hurry up and dive into it but i have to you know it's he keeps speaking it to my heart like you're on an assignment already i got you on an assignment and i'm I'm about halfway through it i'm coming up on psalms (laughs) yeah yeah. i'm on a the one after ezra weird weird name yeah i just you know what i've been doing and 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 this has helped me my my walk in general is i allow people the room to hold me accountable and i do that to on purpose push myself Mm. because once accountability is set i have to show up and if i don't show up then you have the opportunity to be like hey you were supposed to have this done what happened Mm. You know, so, right, right. so I have right now probably multiple brothers that we're going through books like the book that they're going through. I'm going through mm. and I look for people. Hey, what book you in? And then they're like, oh, I'm in this book. OK, how about I do that book, too? And then when you're done with it, we can go over and talk about the scripture because, bro, I just did the book of Esther blew my mind. And it wasn't until, like, is went, Esther right after uh, second? Um, I don't know what's prior to it because we. I just hopped the book of Esther. See, it's Kings, and then it's not Chronicles. It's. Uh, I wouldn't know the order, honestly. I've been I've been pushing to do things chronologically, like you talked about, and when you look at it chronologically in the New Testament, James is first, hmm. then it's Thessalonians. So it's it's a whole different order if you're looking at the date when that was actually. Yeah, you yeah. know. So anyway, Esther, super powerful. <laughs> like, I can't even talk about Esther right now because I promise you it's gonna be a long conversation. Mm. But I will say that the book of Esther foreshadows Christ. And that was the biggest thing that I took away after studying the whole thing. It hit me. Because a king, which king um Man, I can't even say that king's name. It begins with an A. But it would have been Xerxes. So that is the king. He was the biggest king uh, of Persia, period. When Persia was its biggest, right? 
And so this king had authority, right? And he was deceived by Haman, just as Adam had authority and was deceived by Satan. Mm. And then there's a decree that Haman went out to destroy basically all Jewish people and they could not fight back. It was an irrevocable, there was a royal signet ring that came with the message. And if it had that stamp on it by the king, that decree could not be revoked. Well, Mordecai ends up in his place as a Jew. This is a long story short, I'm skipping a lot. He ends up in his place and he does another decree. And that decree allows the Jewish people to fight back. Hmm. And I realized what Adam's disobedience did allowed us to this place where we were powerless to fight against sin. But Jesus came with a new decree that was irrevocable. And that was the cross. And it allows us to fight and no longer does sin have power over us. Mm. Man. Yeah, I, I was just like, bro, in the book of Esther, man, you see this foreshadowing of Christ. It's just like, it blew my mind. Anyway. That is crazy. I have a question for you. Sure. So this is this might be a generic. I promise you the other ones are not generic, so you better be ready. All right. All right. Bring them on. How did your podcast start? How did my podcast start? Um, but I actually started a couple years ago, man. Okay. I did a couple episodes, and then it was like I didn't do it for almost a year. But it started from the quiet place, seeking the Lord on just what I needed to do next. What can I do mm. to be used by you? What can I do to glorify you? And it was... Uh, pretty much open my platforms up to other people mm. and this was the way that came to my mind to do so I actually started um, interviewing people and I would just have people you know testify I would set a camera up on somebody and I wouldn't even be in the shot and I'd be like hey if you had a word for someone who was struggling with depression what would you say mm. or do you got anything you feel on your heart that you feel like some people could uh, need some, some people could need and they would share and then I would upload those things to my social media mm. and um, so this is kind of just like an evolution of that man understanding that uh, everybody's got a light inside of them man everybody's got a testimony yeah and um, we sharpen each other so it's like it's done so much for me too bro the Lord has used it because um I don't have a lot of relations with people. You mm. know, this is like this setting right here is the most relation I'll have with somebody mm. for, you know, a long time or the deepest, at least. Mm. My life is so busy, I guess, you know, always running around, serving somebody, working. Um, so to be able to sit down, man, and have conversations with other people, I guess, you know, kind of like we spoke a little bit before, I've never been a deeply emotional person. Mm. So I can look and see that the Lord is using this as a means even um, to take me deeper. Yeah. Because I'm forced to be in a setting where it's like, okay, we're having a conversation. Yeah. Because if it's like, you leave it up to me and I'm in a public place and somebody's trying to talk to me, it's like, there's not a lot of, you know, if it's not moving us to a place I'm mm. very dry. Yeah. Very dry. So mm. there's that piece of it. Yeah, man. I think it was for me just as much as it was for anybody. Yeah. I but ultimately, it's, it's just crazy, man, because at the end of the day, it's all for his glory. Mm. You know, the development of my character is for his glory. People testifying and... Um, it's been a lot of deep moments in this kind of setting, man. Yeah. For his glory. I bet. Because especially we talked about yeah. ADD, ADHD. <laughs> I don't know if you ever talk about that, but I talk about it. Um, because I don't think it's a disorder. A lot of people see it as a disorder. I think it's the way that the brain works. So you attaching stimulus 
to something almost makes it more juicy and enticing to to really lock into a setting like this i think mm. i think that's part of it is that stimulus adding that stimulus to like oh you know, yeah it like gets you sound, in this, it comes the... yeah it comes in this laser focus yeah like man i'm in this moment yeah, yeah. and i'm so present yeah yeah but yeah it's crazy man because as much as like you know the wall goes both ways as much as i don't press and lend a lot to people i also don't press into myself yeah like i said that's so hands-on so when people ask me questions you know the lord is and, and even that man came from the quiet place it's like okay well i got this podcast i'm bringing people on what in the world do i talk about mm. and it's like everything that has to do with this moment bro came from the quiet place mm. i'm like you prepare five questions for them tell them to prepare five questions for you turn the cameras on and run it and, yeah uh, sometimes i mean i've weeped i've wept on a couple of these shows yeah so it's been a blessing let's move on man we'll try to uh get through right, these yeah. questions next question um why yeah, was my first response long <laughs> it was kind of long when did it, it, it was a little long man it was a little long. i try not to make it too we're 26 long. minutes in <laughs> i try to keep it around an hour were you signaling me in any kind of no way? no okay. i sit here and i'm i'm listening i'm like lord i trust you that whatever's happening in this moment is what needs to happen yeah and i try to clear my mind of any expectations of how it should go right so what do you struggle with today what do i struggle with today um so lust is the biggest struggle lust of the eyes specifically mm -hmm. So that goes into like, so obviously like this was the last challenge when I believe Jesus was on his 40 day fast and Satan said, I'll give you everything I see that you see here. Mm. Right. Lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes. It's like, and so that lust can perpetuate in any kind of way that is creating discontentment in our lives mine is specifically sexual like mine is specifically um you know dealing with my natural who i am there's a lack of deficiency well there's a deficiency in dopamine and so whereas other people dopamine activities are not as highly addictive they're highly addictive to me mm. so when here i am yeah <laughs> when things are i might have done drugs for a long time <laughs> <laughs> yeah when things are associated um in 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 access is so easy nowadays yeah to see things um they can take you on journeys that you never really want to go on you just kind of get sucked in in and your brain is defaulting in these pathways mm -hmm. where you're receiving rewards as you venture into this place that you really don't want to go as a man of God, as a woman of God. Right. But um, like pornography, man, I heard somebody say it was like, you know, their wife was like, how do you how do you keep falling to this? Mm. And he's like, well, think of it like this. He's like, if you ever looked in the mirror and you didn't like what you saw as far as like your weight goes. And you just made this decision, like, I'm not going to eat junk food no more. I ain't going to eat McDonald's no mm -hmm. more because you know it's bad for you. Yeah. But next thing you know, you look down and there's a double cheeseburger in your hand. Yep. And you're like, how did I get back here? Right. And he's like, and it's like a blur from the moment you said you wasn't going to do it until the moment you did it. It's this a blur. Facts. But a lot happened in between there. Yep. You made the decision to get up. You got in your car. You went to the store. You spent money. Yep. You drove back home. You're eating this cheeseburger it's like man whenever Which you said even the default with, you know it's like whenever you start running low or or this process starts kicking in in mm. your body like hunger and yeah. you default to what's pleasurable yeah instantly gratifying man it, it takes so much strength and mindfulness i believe we don't have it within ourselves man you got to be tapped in to the holy spirit uh, yeah absolutely yeah. through prayer and fasting bro yeah and i'm still talking about the diet my diet is is reckless right now <laughs> the only time i've ever experienced a shift in my diet was prayer and fasting yeah 
And I know that it's, uh, you know, whenever you look at the enemy that wages war against us, man, whenever he can get us distracted out of that place of our spirituality, our rootedness in Christ, where we got that power to yeah. face giants, you know, we get distracted and then that's when the attack comes. It's like, man, you literally have to get up and run mm. or you're going to fall. And, and a lot of times I find myself not willing to run mm. because falling seems so much easier in the moment until you do it. And then it's like, man, then it's I like should have once ran. you're done, you're just like, I feel like I should die. <laughs> like I, I literally like, feel why? like that sometimes, bro. I will, I will cry <laughs> sometimes when I watch pornography. I will cry and say I deserve to die. Yeah, I really deserve to die. And man, even in it, God is using it to show me myself. He's like, it's not your works, it's not your abstinence mm. that gains my favor or my love for you. You got to kick that out the door. Don't yeah. give you an excuse to do it because there's consequences for your actions. Yeah. But you have to lose the mentality that I'm going to love you more if you don't do it. Or I'm going to love you less if you do. Yeah. Because, because it's still work based. System. Right. We fall back into like yep. the laws of Moses. Yeah. And it's like, man, Christ, Christ took all that to the cross. Yeah. It's real life war, bro. Yep. But I'll say this. Um, I've made a lot of steps and one of them being reaching out to brothers, mm. which I never did because I'm like, bruh, ain't nobody gonna stop me to do what I want to do in that moment. You know what I mean? Right. But I realized this though, if you have brothers that you talk about the word with and like your main conversation is God all the time. Mm -hmm. You call one of them brothers, you're going to be so fired up about God again. Mm. Like, you're not going to be thinking about, you know, right. doing that. But it uh, is something I'm open about in my marriage, my wife. I think that's important too, man. Super important. Whenever I tried to keep it hidden. Yeah. Dude, it destroyed me. Yep. And when, and you, when you It affected my marriage yeah, greatly. When you don't talk about it either. Like... When you know you've messed up and you still haven't like gone to your wife and said, Hey, I messed up. That's that's a foothold if if you're not confessing that to your wife. Cause because yeah. really what the enemy wants you to do is hide it. Yeah. You know, what he wants to do is build shame around it. Yeah. Because then he knows too, if you like, keep it I, don't, in the dark, I don't know man. if anybody noticed this, but if I don't talk about it and I just kind of keep it a secret. It ends up happening even more, like even frequent, yeah, yeah. even more. Like I'm struggling even more now, not talking yeah. about it. Um, so I've learned to be open about it, and and I have things in place. But me and my wife have come to a thing. Like she knows it's not her. Like it's not that I'm lacking any kind of sexual yeah, yeah. need. And that's because that's not super it. Super important. Yeah, because I was like. Cause it really has nothing to do. Yeah, I said, I said, with this well, I compared other. it to anxiety. I'm like, can I tell you to turn your anxiety off because you love me? He's like, that, that doesn't work. Mm. Like that's something that you have to build and be intentional about and be conscious about and actually push in the other direction away from. Even more so when it comes to sexual sin, when it, the Bible says flee. Yeah, literally run. The last thing you want to do when a seducing spirit is drawing you in is run away. You kind of get more comfortable and get settled in. It's slowly that seduction is just like drawing you in. Gotcha. But you got to get up and do something, man. You got to get up and walk away. You got to get up and turn and open your word. I've done that. I woke up in the morning had a lustful dream like some mm. some, some something seduced me in my dream and it was almost like i was paralyzed in the dream it was just happening yeah. right then i wake up in the morning i have this urge now to dive into some stuff and i've turned over and my bible's right there i'm just i just open it and just start flipping pages and start reading and that's helped me but that would be one of the struggles the other one is uh probably mindfulness because 
I can be fully convinced that I'm doing something that I'm not doing. It's pretty bad. Mm. Um, what do you mean by that? So especially in marriage, I'll feel like I'm fulfilling my role as a husband. Mm. And then my wife will be voicing the opposite. Yeah. And then it would make me frustrated. Like, I, I can never do enough. Yeah. Like, do you not see all the efforts in all the things <laughs> that I'm doing to try to serve you and be there for you? Yeah. And Man. when I really look back at it, when I, when I stopped with my phone, like I started putting my phone away at night and in mm. the morning. That was a big pivotal moment. Jeez. And I started putting my phone away when I talked to my wife. And I realized I would pull up my phone multiple times when I talked to my wife. There would be times she would sit in the same room with me and I would be completely ignoring her, not really giving her my time and not really listening to her. There'd be times where she was in the midst of talking and I was doing something on my phone mm. and not really paying attention to what she was saying. Guilty so, there. Yeah. So, but in my mind, I was putting all this effort and then that's what I mean by mindfulness is sometimes we create our own realities of what we think is going on when really we're being dragged and enticed by our own defaults and we're just in this automated stage not really you know yeah but i think some of that's due to the level of influence devices have on us yeah in this day and age like they really are running our lives in a sense and creating reward systems based on the scroll and likes and comments and yeah all these things so i seek to get to the place man because yeah that can swallow you up yep especially when it starts rolling in mm -hmm. and it's like what am i doing man sitting here <laughs> yeah. refreshing this bro what am i doing mm -hmm. so it's like to become mindful of that and seek to get to a place where it's like man i don't even open these apps unless i'm posting something because yeah. i don't got the intention of commenting you know there's too many it'd take all day yeah so i just don't comment I do what the Lord put on my heart to do, and I put it out there. I fall short still. I'll be on there refreshing, refreshing, watching myself probably more than I should, <laughs> thinking that I'm doing anything. My wife thinks I'm weird for doing that. It She's is like, weird, bro. Why do you watch yourself? I'm like, well, because I like it. Okay? See, in my mind, <laughs> I watch myself imagining what someone is imagining watching me. Do you do yeah. that? No, no. I I just more enjoy my creation. Mm. I even do that with music. Yeah. Every yeah. new song that I get is the new song that I'm playing. Maybe that's just a me thing. I like. I will. I will see someone comment, and mm -hmm. based off of what they said, I will rewatch the video and imagine what they like saw in the video to make them say that's what they interesting. said. I've never heard uh, that and, perspective. And you can get lost in doing that. I can. Um, so yeah man and then back to the pornography thing bro uh, i read a read a scripture i think it was in proverbs he said um the seducing spirit like mm. in the woman is like dangerous and he said don't even go near her house and it's like what does that mean what does that mean don't go near her house and the lord opened it up to me that the house is where she lives the house is where the seducing spirit lives where can you find it mm. that's where it lives it's where you, I know if I go here, it's going to be there. That's social media, bro. Doom scrolling. If you're just scrolling on social media, dude, it's going to be there. That's where she lives. Mm. And so that's another reason to like, I don't got no business being on these apps unless it's not 100% intentional. Bro. <laughs> um, I'm on the browser at this point. <laughs> like, I like, seriously, I check my Facebook and Instagram right now on the browser oh wow bro because that, that's not a bad thing yeah no no i intentionally have a screen time on iphones and this is a little tidbit for anybody that you know wants to use this but uh on iphones they have screen time password yeah yeah i literally give the screen time password to my wife <laughs> So I don't know the password. Oh man! And it like, locks imagine. me. It locks me out of apps. Baby, can you? I just gotta check something real quick. Put the password in. No, no, no. <laughs> I do it on the browser because I don't want to get stuck in scrolling. Yeah. You can scroll for hours, bro. Yes, you can. Time just passes by. You're like trying to look at nothing. Yeah, and it's always stupid stuff. Like I don't know stupid, about anybody else's bro. feed, but mine be stupid. I'll be like, watching something stupid and then I'll send it to people. 
like my brother, like Maury or, or somebody so, close to bro, me. Bro, Maury. And then I, I like start why. thinking about it. I'm like, man, this was just 100% raunchy for one. Bro. It's not teaching him anything. Yes. I shouldn't have sent that. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't got no business watching it myself. Or stuff that's funny. Like, stuff that's funny. I was funny. sharing <laughs> out with my friends. Oh, yeah. man. Right. What you got for me, brother? Okay. Next one. Um, if you could keep one thing the same in your life and everything had to change... What would you choose to be the same and why? Besides your relationship with God, outside of your relationship with God, if there was one thing that you can keep the same in your life and everything else had to change, what would you choose to stay the same and why? Oh, man. I'm probably going to have to make a cut on this. Why? That's deep, bro. Oh, I have a couple of like that. I told you. I said if I had to keep one thing the same and everything else had to change. <laughs> my height. <laughs> Your height. I don't know. It's like, what would I want to stay the same? Because it's like, I'm going to help you out here. I feel like, man, uh, <laughs> yeah. every everything that I think of, like, what would I, would I keep it the same? It's like. I see everything in my life as a constant development. So I feel like for me to keep anything the same, I would hinder it. I mean, I mean, a part of your life. Keep it a part of my life? Yeah, yeah. No, no, like everything else has to change. But there's only one thing that you can keep a part of your life. Well, that would be my marriage. Okay. Um, outside of my relationship with God. That's a good answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if that was why, if, if it was in my, if that's like what I'm faced with, what do you have to let go of? Um, it would have to be my marriage, man, because uh, that's what's honorable. It's what I've been entrusted with, and that's what I've made a commitment to. Outside of my relationship with God, like, you know, that's next. And so, and and I know that if I made that decision, everything else would flourish. And if I was presented with that choice to make, I would have to trust that it's for my good. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a pretty short answer. Yeah. That's good. Let me see what I got for you. <laughs> Hopefully you got it. We well, got, these we ones, maybe they'll be these. short because we're already like 40 minutes in. All right, man. Here's a good <laughs> one for you. If you had a word for someone who was struggling, what would it be? For someone who's struggling... Maybe That's a case uh, by case. Obviously, you want to be led by the Holy Spirit. So I don't think there's one word for every person that's struggling. Thanks. Um, but I will say. What's the first struggle that came to your mind? Uh, there wasn't a struggle that came to my mind. I, I'm trying to think of. <laughs> I'm trying to think of someone would, who, who was struggling, but. Could be depression. I think everything, bro. My, my, yeah, brokenness. It could be any kind of struggle, right? Where do our struggles come from? I think I've summed it up to a lack of being in God's presence, man. Mm, or being. Because it's like. I would really say will. a lack of God investment. Because you can invest in your relationship with God in the spirit in many ways beyond just being in God's presence because being in God's presence is good without truth not so good all the time you know what I mean like because you can constantly um, choose to be in God's presence but not really pursue to be God being the Lord over your life right yeah 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 so um, I think by what I mean by being in God's presence is like you know, all these you all are the in things. right standing you are actively in obedience right okay to god and it's ultimately like that involves that would be a different communicating with god god's going to communicate back yeah. are you listening okay that would be a different stance than that's what i mean by being in god's presence okay. i feel like the moment i say i'm not doing what you want i'm no longer in, god's in your presence, presence. Yeah, yeah yeah so you know, like you mean like for me to David... stay in god's presence i got to be yeah my heart has to be after him and i got to be submitted right true and so you're talking about and like, whenever that's a thing man it's like i real life there's nothing i can't face mm. 
I don't struggle. Right. I find that when I'm struggling, I'm falling short. I'm, I'm in my will. Mm. I'm in my understanding. God really protects me, bro. Yeah. He really protects us. Man. When we are. So you're saying like David's position when he says, don't take your presence from me. Because he knew he was disobedient. And mm. then. So, yeah. I would understand it from that perspective. But I know there's circles of people that believe in presence being. Um, works no like the, the time, time of the time and attention and awareness of god being in the room is what they call being in god's presence like mindfully seeking god. yeah mindfully being with him yeah in a room but i've seen where that can pervert it but that's not what you yeah. you mean you um get real it goes back and all like so, works based but at the same time too I think telling someone that they're struggling, what I tell them, um, man, you just need to be in God's presence. I feel like I feel like if I was to say to someone <laughs> that's struggling, hey man, you just need to be in God's presence. Think right, like, right, right, right. You can be like, what does that mean? What is that? <laughs> um, man, this is a this is a tough question because. I feel like there's so many variables in my head. I'll just say this. The answer you're looking for to any temporary void in your life is only found in an eternal life source that is God alone. And the more you attempt to try to fill your life with these things that actually have no depth to them, the more you're going to understand and feel that your life is actually lacking substance. Mm -hmm. But if you want true substance, if you want true foundation in your life where you feel like you have something to stand on, then God is the way, the truth, and the life that you actually need in every area. Amen. That's probably what I was saying. There it is right there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I know that was like a little beat around, but... <laughs> dude, but I, I felt like I felt like something just happened. It was like a chaos, chaos, chaos. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> this is what you need. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's like, bro. So, yeah, I t like, I think there's both sides, right? There's like the spiritual in the moment, but then there's also like the critical thinking side, which I think is a gift. Like, for God to give us the ability to critically think is a gift from God. God is a thinker. He's a genius. So mm. saying is a one size fits all. Right. Is saying that we don't have a personal God because he meets everybody where they're at yeah. differently. Anyway, whatever. I, I think that was beautiful, man. <laughs> After I was I was being deep for a minute, it's just yeah, like, I like oh. <laughs> and then it's just like, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, now it's my turn, right? Yes, sir. Okay, this is a good one. This is gonna make you think. Okay, mm -hmm. would you rather be financially free and not content, or poor and fully content? That's easy, bro. I'd rather be poor. Okay. Fully content. Are you content now? It comes in waves. Okay. It goes back to the being mindful, man. Uh, I'm aware just through my experience that when it comes to trying to find contentment in the things of the world, dude, it's an unquenchable thirst. Yeah. For what's next the better thing there's always going to be something bigger and better and i can see where people absolutely get lost in it mm. because i can look at people who are financially or materialistically you know way ahead of me and they're still scratching and clawing for the next thing mm. i can remember even for example with the car that i got before i had that car i was like it was the best thing in the world I'm researching people who got it. I'm researching how they're building it, mm. what it's capable of. And imagine in my life whenever I get it and I'm watching all these videos and then I get it and it's awesome. And like a month later, it 
it's like, mm. man, this is a car. It's not as shiny. It's not as cool yeah. as I thought it was. What's next? And I'm looking for the thing, you know, mm. that's next. Right. And so that takes a lot of energy, man. And you apply that to like every area of your life. For me, it's like videography, it's production, it's creation, thinking I need this or that to progress in those kind of things. Mm. So it's like, that takes a lot of mental resources of looking at things that you don't yet have. And for me, are not in a position to get. So now I'm operating out of a mindset of lack. Mm. And so it's like the real richness is to find contentment with what I got because then I'm free. I have all those mental resources that I was given to things that I can't obtain right now to use what I already have mm. and so create with it. Let me let me pose this question. So do you think in our relationship with God that sometimes we find ourselves not content with where we have grown from and trying to constantly strive to grow mm. more. <laughs> Ooh, this just flipped the script. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> because, wow. It's know, like, is finding contentment in your relationship with God a good thing? I think, yes. Wait, 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 wait. What because about there's this? Because there's a difference between... There's, there's a difference Hold between... Hold on, my brain needs to process this. <laughs> okay. I find contentment in the world does that open up the avenue to grow spiritually if I find contentment spiritually am I seeking to grow in the world say again if I find contentment spiritually mm -hmm. meaning no more growth is happening I'm not seeking to grow I'm content no, nothing else needs to be added to me. Then I try to start to uh, prosper uh, in the uh, world. You, you're but if I find up, contentment in the world, where it's like nothing needs to be added no, to you're me, mixed, you're I got everything up I need. The meaning of contentment will that allow me to grow spiritually, right? But you're mixing up the definition of contentment with complacent. Very different things. You can be content. Let's look that up. Yeah, yeah. I need to. I need to knowledge myself. You can be content and feel like you're okay where you are doesn't mean that you don't want to grow past it. Okay. But Paul, like he said, whether I am hungry or I am uh, full, yeah, yeah, I have learned to be content okay. wherever I'm at. He didn't say that I've because I'm content, I'm complacent in being hungry. So I'm just going to stay being hungry. No, he said that no matter where he was at, whether in a, a place... A feeling of quite happiness and satisfaction. Exactly. Contentment. Are you satisfied... What was the other word you said? Uh, complacent. Complacent would be what you're explaining. A feeling of uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. And like it's not good enough. Complacent? Complacency. Look at that definition again. The difference between contentment and complacency is a subtle one. Being content means being happy. Being complacent means refusing to work to improve. Exactly. Complacent means I'm not willing to grow. Not willing to grow. Content means I'm happy with where I'm at. I'm happy where I'm at. But I'm open for but more. But I'm open for more. Or less. Yes, or less. I'm okay with whatever. But, no, no, no. I'm okay with wherever I, like... There's this place you can be, I believe, where you can have full peace of where you are without striving to constantly grow as a way of necessity. Instead, knowing that I'm so grateful for what God has done here mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm, I'm at peace with where I am and I'm proud of what God has done mm -hmm. in my life. Now, I know he's going to grow me past this point, but I don't need to strive. I don't need to strive to make things happen all the time, but I can sit in a place of trust and acceptance of where I'm at, knowing that God is going to lead me to greater places, to greater growth. So that's what I mean. Have you found that contentment? Because what I do 
is I constantly am like, I need to grow, need to grow, need to grow. But then there's this dissatisfaction that settles in about where I am to where even if I'm way farther along than you've I ever was been or ever been, <laughs> I am. You feel like you're I miles still, behind where you're supposed I, to be. Exactly. And there's no contentment. There's no satisfaction in where God has taken me. It's just, I, I, I need to go here. And I feel like that comes in waves too. Yeah. Yeah. For me as well. I, I know it's something I struggle with because I am constantly on the next thing. Yeah. And sometimes and it's like I'm inconsistent in the things God has already taught me because I'm on to the next revelation. Mm-hmm. I'm on to the next thing that he's telling me. And I still haven't really dived into the things that he has told me yeah, yeah. here or I was consistent in them for a while. And then I broke off with them because there's no stimulus there anymore. I'm on to the next new thing. I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah. Just like with this printing stuff. I'm already looking into <laughs> yeah, a whole new method. The next, thing, barely, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. Barely uh, typed into the method I'm already doing. But part of that is the way our minds work. Yeah. I think that if I do it this way, it's going to produce more fruit. Yeah. This ain't producing enough fruit for me right now. Yeah. When in reality, it's probably because I haven't watered it too much. Bro, I told you when I, when I decided. It's not growing. Because I'm not tending to it. Bro, when I decided to just get in the word, I guess, like we were talking about, just decided to drop everything that was keeping me from getting in the word, which was my phone day and night. So scrolling at night, scrolling in the morning. That was a big one. Uh, cut it out. When I, That's what allowed me to get into the word like I am mm-hmm. was the time that I would spend on my phone at night. Yep. And now get in the word. Yep. It's still on my phone. But uh, I found that, you know, I've read 600 and some chapters out of the Bible in the last half a year. Mm. I've read more of the Bible in the last four months for sure in the last couple years combined. Yeah. That's beautiful. Just, just from that one decision. That's like, beautiful. When I'm laying in bed, instead of being on social media, bro, I'm going to read the word. I think, I think some people overestimate. Like what they can That's actually crazy, or underestimate what they can actually get done. Just knocking one thing, one habit that you have, one thing that's keeping your time. Knock that one thing out and put something that you want to grow in in in, the, in place of it. Yeah. You'll realize you have a lot more time than you actually. Bro, fast. That's what it is, man. That was Bro, just coming to my mind. If you go into a fast... You realize how much time you spent preparing the food, getting the food, eating the food, thinking about the food, washing the dishes. And then when you're by the time you're done, it's like an hour and a half, two hours each meal. And then after you think about it, you're relaxing a little bit. You're kind of letting your belly t- uh-huh. your tummy a little settle, you know, yeah. <laughs> I found, too, that we're creatures of momentum, man. That's where we build these habits. Mm-hmm wake up and a lot of times uh, we just go to this autopilot thing of where our habits are where the momentum is flowing in our life and i think that whenever we fast man that's why i said like a lot of these things are only through prayer and fasting it's like whenever you pray you're taking the momentum that was going one way and you're trying to direct it somewhere else Mm -hmm. and there's an element of fasting that whenever you stop eating it's like whenever we eat it converts what we eat into momentum go wherever we've directed it to go Mm. and when we stop that it it's almost like things start to reel back in and we're able to shift and then once we start eating again it it sends it into a different direction Mm. i've experienced that man with the diet uh one time i was fasting to get off of nicotine i ended up changing my whole diet bro in three days i quit eating for three days and whenever i started eating again it was a flip 180 I mean, I was eating junk food and then it was like, boom, nothing processed at all. Downloaded a cookbook. I got this little Instapot mm. and I'm just eating all real food. And that sustained for uh, months, man, until this one little 
little piece by bro, a piece. just one little relapse. Uh, let me get this little donut over here. Get this little crumble. Cookie. Oh, this pizza sounds good for tonight, and now it's just like, bro. Uh, I just said crumble cookie. I'm pretty sure my wife is in the other room. Like, yeah, we getting crumble. I ate crumble cookie earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you saw it. She's gonna want it. Okay, whose turn is it? It's your, your turn. I see what you struggle with. No, oh, yeah. it is my turn. I see your contentment. Yeah. All right, let's see. Two here. more questions on my side. Yeah, we're about to wrap this boy up because one of these cameras, brother. Yeah, yeah, let's get it. We have a good battery. Oh, we, Lord Jesus. Okay. What is God teaching you right now within your marriage? In my marriage? Um, right now? So we just went through the four laws of love. Um, But we're going through a book called ADHD, ADD, The Effect on Your Marriage. When did you guys start reading books together? That was probably a month and a half ago. Nice. Yeah. What would you say that's done? For you? That's changed everything in our marriage. Just reading books. Like, yeah, because we, we've had good communication. Uh -huh. um, we've struggled to find counseling because we never found people that were like, Oh, we want our marriage to be like theirs. Like, we just didn't have that. So God kind of developed us in marriage. Mm. But um, approaching that book, we're like, our marriage is great. But let's just see what's in here. Yeah. And the book is very helpful. You know, having that outside perspective and a biblical perspective on your marriage and, and how to grow together and different needs that you probably just don't think about when it comes to um, your spouse. So I would say the biggest thing that it changed was just awareness and understanding on both sides. So when we do it, we cook breakfast and, and I'll have one ear in, she'll have one ear in. And we'll just be like making breakfast, having breakfast together, starting our day together um, in that devotion. Yeah. And you guys do that often? Every morning now. Wow. Or if, if we don't have breakfast, we won't. But um, almost every morning, just about I forget who I was talking about man but they was talking about that morning routine with their wife too oh it's yeah like, me and my wife have such different schedules yeah uh, she wakes up early yeah and she's gone for eight hours it's like me I can wake up whenever I want mm -hmm. I don't abuse that but I don't wake up at six in the morning you know what so time she usually leave out she leaves at seven I usually am up and out of bed around anywhere between eight to nine yeah Yeah, it's beautiful. I love it, bro. Even so, through it, reading the books, let's get back to your question. Um, yep. What, what the Lord is teaching her. Yeah. Yep. So, through reading the books, uh, I mean, we learned a lot about each other. But I'll say, I'll say the the most recent change and thing was the book from ADHD, ADD on marriage, because. I didn't realize how much that was actually affecting the way that I think and do things and how much responsibility I was actually leaving in the hands of my wife to where I kind of can go free and do all these things and mm -hmm. and have time to myself. But she's thinking, oh, well, I got to do laundry. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this because Joseph's not good at organization and and bills like she she takes over that department as well so she has bills on her mind we gotta pay this gotta do this and so and i just i realized how hard sometimes my personality and the way my mind works makes it on on my wife yeah and so that's probably yeah, the re recent thing that i learned is like how do I create systems that work for me that keep her top of mind? So I've thought like multiple reminders of clean the house when she's not there. Yeah. Because I will live in a mess and not even know there's a mess. Same. I can just hyper focus in a mess. And, and it's like care. for me because she come in like, hello, yeah, yeah. like, why did you think to clean this? Why didn't you think to clean this? Yeah. Why is the cabinet door open? Why is this? It didn't bother me. I didn't even. But it bothers her. Yeah, I, I went in there. I grabbed the plate of food. I put it in the microwave. 
I didn't even think about closing the cabinet door because I was so focused on putting whatever I was putting in the microwave and then eating it. After I ate, I put it down. I got distracted. I started doing this. Yeah. <laughs> and then it, and then it's like <laughs> it'll sit there for a couple of days until yeah. somebody. <laughs> it just magically goes away. It's only yeah. on its own. But. So that's probably the nah. biggest thing is like. Like I said, bro, we create our own realities in marriage, in relationships, and it's not always reciprocated. So it's like, that's why it's just wise to have these discussions and do these things with your spouse because you actually find out that you're missing opportunities to learn them properly mm. and make your marriage actually better. Yeah. Amen, bro. Yeah. It's tough work. <laughs> like it's very rewarding though, man. Oh yeah. And it bleeds the Lord's into really opening my eyes to like man, the gift. The gift that was given to us. No. Being our wife. And we would just pursue it like we pursue everything else. We would see how much of a gift it is. Bro. So and I feel like that's a pretty universal calling. When I speak to people about it, it's like we're all kind of, you know, the Lord is pouring something out on his people and we're experiencing it at the same time, man. Bro, the the times of... When you look back on history of like Good. where, what has happened and, you know, my dull understanding of it, but it's like, you know, a lot of things got switched up when the woman started going Come to work. That's exactly what I was going to say. Family started breaking up. And yeah. it's like things are trying to go back to their natural place. And ultimately, that's God's design. And whenever we press into him, mm. and we are, we find that, you know, he's leading us to the way that it's supposed to be. And it's far from the way that it's been lived generations before us. Especially, in a lot of situations. Especially within ministry. Mm. Especially within ministry, because the time of ministering outside of your house while as far your as house I know, is not in order my grandparents there was no ministry especially in the marriage my parents there was no ministry until you know halfway through my life so it's like wow wow <laughs> that's crazy bro it's crazy when you really think about it of like where we have come from and what God is working out presently right now yeah through us. Yeah. It's wild, bro. <laughs> yep. Jesus. Okay, I think it's my turn, right? Yes, sir. Dang it. We're bro. good, man. We're an hour and eight minutes in. We got this. I know. I only got one more for you. I'm looking at the time, though. Okay. We'll wrap it up, man. We got about 10 minutes. I'm going to finish with this one. Okay. I mean, you finish with yours. What is the deepest root of trauma and how does it bleed into your life now? Deepest root of trauma? Mm -hmm. I think um, the emotional void. Emotional void. You know, my parents, they faced a lot of trauma in their life. I probably don't know the half of it, but what I do know is that it was deep and dark. Real dark, man. Um, and it's almost in a sense that I can see that they did the best that they could to stop that darkness from bleeding into our lives. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that wall that's built goes both ways to not let bad stuff out is to not let good stuff in. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think just not having that outlet to connect with people deeply emotionally um, has definitely lingered into my adult life. I wouldn't say that it's like some big, crazy traumatic experience, but it's a hindrance for mm -hmm. sure. And maybe it is, man. Maybe that was a, a big source of my pain growing up, you know? I had a lot of pain inside of me. I know that for sure. Uh, a lot of uncertainties, identity crises. I mm -hmm. um, started thinking of taking my life at a really young age. And uh, so that's there. It still lingers. But, you know, through and by my relationship with God, uh, he's working it out, man. What made you become emotionally, like, 
the emotional void? I think um, not being poured into emotionally, for one, and not being able to voice my emotions. From your parents? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times if, you know, we spoke anything that was outside of their direction um, and there was resistance, it's their way or their highway. And it was just best to do it their way. So a lot of times I can remember feeling ways and not being able to voice it or get it out of me. So it just gets bottled up, mm. you know? And eventually it's like that just calluses and what's supposed to be able to flow freely um, is now damned and gummed up. Mm. So uh, I'm, trying to think I, I can look, root, I'm trying to think of the root of that because fear, man. <laughs> Well, like you there's saying, there's fear involved. Yeah, no, no, no. But um, I mean, but you see, it's crazy because it's like I know, I know that if I would pour my heart out, even to my parents, yeah, like I can make my parents cry, bro. And I did it this Christmas. I wrote them. I made a prayer cloth, and I wrote them personalized messages on it. Yeah, and I told them to read it out loud. Dude, it took them like thirty minutes a piece <laughs> to read these prayer cloths because they were so emotional. Mm -hmm. Because that just does not happen. It hasn't happened. So like I said, man, uh, I'm not really too concerned on where it came from or how it happened. I'm more concerned of like being free to liberate it from it. Yeah, but I think too, sometimes so like for me, I was closed up because of my feelings of abandonment and feelings of being overlooked. I think being overlooked, um, compared myself to my siblings a lot. Just uh, lonely, man. Mm -hmm. Lonely. Like I said, no. Really. Do you feel overlooked sometimes now, or no? Okay. I wouldn't say so. Because that would mean that would be like what I mean by like, how does it bleed into your life now? For the way it bleeds in my life now is um, not being able to let out what I know is in me. Mm. You know, even like to my wife. I think like, you know, there's been times where I've spoke to her and it's just made her cry, but in a good way. Like I make you feel good about yourself and I know that's in me. Why can't I give that freely all the time? Cause it's a good thing or even to you, bro. Mm. Why can't I pour into you and just move you the way I know that I can do it and be vulnerable uh, and sincere, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but, uh, it's not near as bad as it used to be. Yeah. So I have faith that um, I believe it's a gift, bro. I believe it's a gift that he's invested into me. And I can see that that's why the attack has um, came against it. Since I can remember to shut me up, to make me closed off. Talking was a struggle for me, man. Yeah. My whole life. And now I finally, that's <laughs> what I do all the time. All the time. Right. So, uh. Man, uh, we're going to wrap it up with this question, bro. I know you got to hit the road. You got a long yep. drive back. And um, we'll just end it with this, man. The word says that who the sun sits free is free indeed. Can you testify? Testify. Testify. Yeah, I'm free. I'm free from all my addictions, nicotine, weed since I was 11 years old, ecstasy. It's everything, you know, like anything that you probably dabbled in, except for like some serious stuff I, I did dabble in. Um, but man, true freedom, new life. Mm. Yeah. Just, uh, I remember when my change was happening and I felt like my family just didn't know me anymore. <laughs> You know, whenever I sit here and I'm listening to you talk, and the worst is that we're born again. Mm -hmm. It's like when we're born the first time, we're born into darkness. It's yeah. like this pure baby that you got sitting in here. Or, you know, we was that at one point in time. Yeah. And through time, we just got darker and darker and darker and darker. Yeah. And you get to a place where it's like dark. Dark. And then you're born again. And, and I think we make the mistake of thinking that we're supposed to be clean cut and put together in a moment. Mm. 
But in reality, we just started going the other way. And as time progresses and mm -hmm. we walk and we mature, it gets lighter and lighter, lighter and, and lighter. lighter. So these burdens, this darkness is falling off of us. Bruh. You know, I still have my struggles, but compared to the darkness that I was in when the Lord came to me, hey. I'm not the same person, bro. Not. And a lot of those chains have fell off of me. Bruh. So when he says, like, the work I started in you, I'm faithful and just to see it to completion. completion. It's happening, man. Yeah, bro. That's, I, that's I've, the testimony. Since I've gotten saved, every three months, I look back and I'm like, man, wow. Praise God. Who is that dude? And sometimes even people walk up to me and be like, you know, you said this like a month ago, or you said this like three months ago. I said, I said that. <laughs> like, mm. I had some of those moments too, bro. But yeah, it's just, it's just a new life. Amen. It's a new life. Well, brother, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. It's yeah. been a pleasure, pleasure knowing you. Thanks for I appreciate me. you, man. I appreciate the word that you invest into me and uh, just the ability to brush up against you, man. And a mm -hmm. lot of the things that you say to me, um, I take to heart and uh, I listen to you. And I even put things into practice, things you don't even know about. Mm. So I value you, man. Now and, I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, just little, little little nuggets you give me here and there, man. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a blessing. Appreciate you, time. bro. Yes, I love sir, you. Man. I love you too, bro. Yeah. Listen, if you're still watching, <laughs> if you're still watching at this point, God bless you. I hope something in this message or this conversation uh, helped you, edified you, sharpened you in any way. We appreciate you, and we'll see you next time. Yee! <laughs> All right, uh, man. Bye.